Well, some of you know I have been going through a process of studying the history of China. This is something that uh, you know I've known for a long time. That it's uh, it's just a, a blob on the map that I didn't know as much about as I thought I should. And I'd kind of been dancing around uh, looking at it, and now I've started. Uh, uh, I'm kind of going through it in, in a in a period uh, a way of. Um, segment by segment, looking at um, particular areas, reading about them relatively comprehensively, and then move on to others. And I'm just now finishing up the first section. Um, uh, just to give you some idea on uh, where I started, I, you know, I've been thinking I should do books on China for a long time, um, but what really got me interested was two. This book, Power and Culture by Akira Irie. And then this book, Japan's Imperial Army. Well, you might ask, what what do two books about Japan and World War II, essentially, or Japanese imperialism, have to do with China? Well, quite a bit. I I had known, I I had decided a long time ago that I should know a lot more about China than I did. Um, World War II is something I did know a lot about, and that's sort of the anchor point. When I read the book uh, Japan's Imperial Army, uh, you quickly learn that Japan's main strategic thinking really focused uh, with uh, an antagonistic view towards uh, Russia and that they viewed that basically China was very very important uh, in any plans they might have. Uh, essentially if, if China was a strong ally or a satellite or a colony then they would have um, the ability to resist the Russians and if it was a Russian ally or if it was neutral they likely would not. Um, so after I read those books I decided I really should look into China more and then the book that I decided um, to kind of bridge the gap with the Chinese history that I was somewhat familiar with into areas that I was less familiar with was this Chiang Kai-shek China's Generalissimo and the nation he lost. Now of course I knew who Chiang Kai-shek was before but I didn't know very much about him and the one thing I like about a biography uh, and you know when I went on Amazon I just looked at lots of biographies and I read in the comments you know what the reviews were like is, you know, over the course of their life, this kind of connects a lot of history. You know, Chiang Kai-shek was born in the 1880s, so he grew up in the late imperial period, he was active politically in the imperial period, and then in the um, the warlord period after that, on up through World War II, the Civil War, and that brings us up basically to modern China, um, or, you know, China under the rule of the communists. Uh, and actually have several books on communist rule that I have not read yet. I think I will do them next. Um, but as we see, I have a biography on Mao. I have another biography on Mao somewhere around here. Actually, I actually have two books on the Great Famine, Harvest of Sorrow by Robert Conquest. Actually, this is about the Soviet famine. Sorry, Hungry Ghost, Mao's Great Famine. I think I do have another one on the Chinese family somewhere else. Um, but I decided first to look at the last dynasty of China. It's spelled uh, Q-I-N-G, uh, the Qing. And I read, uh, the book on Chang kind of covers that a little bit, but I read uh, China's Last Empire, the Great Qing. I read this. Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, China, the West, and the epic story of the Taiping Civil War. You know, I had first heard about the Taiping Civil War when I was just a little kid. At the very beginning of Ken Burns' documentary, The Civil War, uh, he just offhandedly mentions what else is going in the world, going on in the world. He says there's a rebellion in China. This supposedly 20 million people died. Um, that is, of course, a very rough estimate, uh, but it is probably the largest such rebellion in world history and something very few Americans know anything about and other than knowing its name and that it had something to do with um, unusual fusionist Christian beliefs I didn't know anything about it so this book is hardly comprehensive but you know having read it I know a great deal more about the Taiping Rebellion than I did previously and then currently this will be my last book on the King Let's see as this China marches west. I am just started this today. This is about the Qing uh, conquest of Central Asia, or Central Eurasia, as this author likes to call it. 
um, during the, especially the 18th, but also some of the 19th century, kind of ends in the 19th century. Um, and I think once that's done, I'm going to go back and read the communist ones, the Mao books, and then go back to the previous dynasty before the Qing, which of course is the Ming. I only have one book on that so far, Trouble Empire. This is actually about the, the Ming and the Yuan. Yuan. Um, I'm, which the Yuan are the Mongols, that's Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan, all that. Um, however, it's going to be a while before I get to that point. Because I, I, I'm off, st I'm doing a China book and then I'm following another program where I'm reading the, um, the stuff that uh, John Taylor Gatto recommended in his interview. Those are pretty short though, and I'm doing a China one of those, China one of those. When I finish um, those, I'll start another program interspersed with the China. You can only do so much at one time. But anyway, the reason I'm doing this isn't just to give you a, an overview of Chinese history. It's to, it's mostly to say that once you start really studying history, you start to really notice um, the biases that um, popularize that history. So, um, and at first, you know, I was thinking in terms of there are some really strong libertarian biases about Chinese history that are really not very accurate. Uh, but I would like to generalize and say that's really not a libertarian bias, it's an everyone's bias. And I don't mean just about Chinese history. There's a lesson to be learned here about uh, selectivism. Um, now in the, not to go into tons of details, but in the libertarian tradition or view of history, you know, China is this big country with lots of people and lots of capital and lots of wealth, and yet there's no industrial revolution. It's, it's backwards. Uh, it's... Um, today very poor and then the the reason is to just say well that's because they're not libertarian It's because they didn't have a free market and they had a big government and uh, you know their big oppressive non-free market uh, you know meant that all of that all those human capital and actual capital was basically squandered and so the relatively more free market say especially England but Western European Europeans in America had a huge, adv huge advantage even though they're younger and they don't have as much capital and they don't have as big population. That is an unbelievably um, selective and essentially completely inaccurate view of China. Um, I think it is very hard to argue, especially in uh, the 18th and 17th centuries, that China was any less free market than, say, the United Kingdom was. Uh, you know, these are books that I'm reading. They're not by libertarians. In fact, they tend to be by people with a very strong Marxist bent. Um, they're not trying to persuade people about, uh, you know, uh, the efficaciousness of markets or whatnot. And they're not even really that interested in the economy by and large. However, an awful lot about how the society is arranged can be kind of, uh, can be gauged when they're just talking about, like, this is how the system works. Um, there was private property in land, could be uh, bought and sold. The taxes were very, very low, uh, especially in uh, in the uh, let's see, 18th century. Uh, there was a long period of peace. There was contract law, though it wasn't actually administered by the state. That's state. That's actually fairly complicated. Um, the the emperors. This is very interesting. Um, the so, socially speaking, the most powerful cultural force in China, and I think this is still true, is is Confucianism. And Confucianism has kind of an interesting um, effect on how the government is supposed to operate or is thought to supposed to operate. Um, Confucianism has a very strong filial piety. They're basically worship of the father. The father and then the subsequent ancestral fathers are, are almost deities. And in the view of many... Uh, especially Qing rulers, I, I haven't read about the others, so I don't know for sure, but the Qing rulers were taking their cues from Confucius. Um, if the emperor had to take too much of everyone's taxes, then he was not leaving enough for the um, fathers, the heads of households, and that was bad. And so during the uh, 18th century, there were two very long reigning emperors. Um, two of them are basically the longest reigning emperors in Chinese history and some of the longest reigning rulers ever. Um, there was the Kangxi and then his grand, the, the Kangxi emperor and then his grandson. Both of them ruled for 61 years. The, the grandson, and I forget his name, um, he actually resigned one day before 
he would have ruled longer than his grandfather as a symbol of filial piety. But during their periods, they actually abolished several taxes, the capitation tax, they reduced land taxes, several taxes were simply allowed to go into abeyance. Um, so they had relatively free markets, probably as free as those in the West. And so, you know, the libertarian kind of view that you read, which I know I've read in Rothbard and I've read in some other places, is essentially, a, I don't want to say an ignorant one, but it's a very selective one. But this is what you notice with all kinds of people. They don't like to look at the actual story. They're not not really interested in history, and then they just cherry pick. But the thing you realize about history is there's so much. There's such a huge volume of material that's written, and then, of course, there's so much that you never read or that never was written that you can dr draw any conclusion you wish and uh, do so by picking this or that little bit of information. But those are such a tiny sampling that they don't, that it's hardly um, informative about reality if, if you operate in that fashion. And it's even worse because now we're to the point where most people aren't even surveying the information and cherry picking. They're just hearing where other, where other people have done the cherry picking. They're taking that little tiny bowl and then thinking they understand the entire forest that you know some of the fruit trees grow in. Uh, it's just completely erroneous. Now, a thorough study of the history, um, and I think that what I'm doing is a relatively thorough set study. I'm not going to be a Chinese expert after this. I don't think that I would be in a position to necessarily get a degree in it or anything like that, but I'll know way more than anyone I'm likely to meet, and I'm already to the point where I can... I'm, I'm much more aware of things, even in the... Uh, contemporary political circles. Um, I was just today watching some documentaries by the CCTV, the Communist China Ch Chinese TV International, and I can I can recognize a lot of what they're talking about, what's, um, you know, so lots of the, th modern China has a lot more to do with the, the imperial dynastic China than I would have originally have thought. There isn't a huge disconnect, uh, and the, the violence of the Communist Party was um, relatively short-lived, however, I mean, it's the greatest violence China's ever had, but it didn't really necessarily mark a gigantic departure. They did not embrace, in the long run, the kind of radical communism that Mao was talking about, and China today is, in many ways, the successor of the Qing and the Ming and the Yuan, and all the way going, all the way back to, you know, the Shang, uh, or the Zhao. Yeah, the Shang first, and then the Zhao. Uh, going way back. Uh, and one interesting aspect of this, uh, most people have probably heard of the so-called Three Gorges Dam, and actually there are other waterworks programs in China that are probably even bigger. There's one they're going to do, the South-North transfer, where they're going to take a whole bunch of water from the Yangtze and other rivers in the South and transport it to the Yellow River Basin and the more arid areas to the North. Um, and I've heard about that stuff for years. I never realized that is the hallmark and the defining characteristic of Chinese uh, state power since the very first emperor who was probably a myth. Uh, in fact, I think what was his name? Yuan the Great or something like that. Um, you know, he's kind of like the Johnny Appleseed character uh, who, you know, created the Chinese state and he did it by controlling the flooding and the Yellow River. Um, Chinese it, governments have kind of said, we're legitimate because we're able to manage the floods on these rivers to dam them to irrigate and whatnot and and the stuff that the communists are doing today i always kind of thought oh they're just trying to show off and see that they're modern because they can build a dam on the yangtze river um and that's true but it's also this is kind of how chinese governments show that they're a legitimate state is but through waterworks that's how they show off that's how they demonstrate their legitimacy to the people that's the 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 scheme or the the meme that's necessary for their legitimacy, and so they engage in it. There's other things too <laughs> about uh, you know their relationship with their with their neighbors, especially in Central Asia, Tibet. Um, you know, if you watch the CCTV episodes on on the Qing, uh, it's interesting how they just say, "Oh, well, you know, Tibet's always been part of China," and and so uh, you know we're just reunifying. And it's clear that there's contemporary political reasons for them doing that. Um, I also want to say it was very interesting because interposed between reading those books on China, I read this book, Farewell to Alms, and I'm reading this book also right now. Not quite done with it. 
uh, bourgeoisie dignity. And both of these analyze in depth from an economic point of view the claims that China was uh, not a free market and that it was, you know, had this oriental despotism and that's why it didn't have the economic growth, the industrial revolution that happened in Western Europe. Um, and it was kind of interesting because I was already just by reading the books on China deciding that, that didn't really fit. And then we have these two very distinguished economists essentially going over the same data and saying the same thing, uh, which was not my plan to read books that were going to discuss the same topics like that. You know, uh, Gary North had recommended uh, those latter two books. I just happened to read them in interposed with all these other Chinese history books. And uh, I don't know. So they, they kind of agree with that same assessment. So it's not just a libertarian thing though everyone kind of just likes to go in there and cherry pick what they do and don't want to believe in and it's unless I'm not saying then that everyone should become a huge history buff and spend all their money on books and read about every single country that they possibly can although I find it very, I do that because mostly I find it interesting I'm not doing this just because I want to win debates and YouTube or whatever it's because I'm generally very curious when I look at a map I'm I look at the countries the, the shapes I wonder about what are those like, and then there's the historical dimension to that as well, where it's like, well, what was that society like? What is its history? What are its peoples like? What were, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I just want to know. I'm just really curious. And it, to me, it's like reading fiction. It's like, this is really cool. Um, but it does have the side benefit is I can call bullshit like crazy. Now, one thing that it is interesting about studying the Chinese, even if they did have a free market, the Chinese state is in many ways the quintessential super state. Um, the resources that it commanded, the power that it wielded, the history, the Elan, whatever, of the Chinese imperial state uh, is second to none. Uh, and yet, by every standard that people think of, it completely failed. And the reason why is very interesting. I'm not saying I know what the reason is, but I think that was, makes it so interesting to study. Uh, one thing I will say is, and, and I just want to address kind of like this one thing is a lot of people think the government would work if we just had, instead of, you know, politics or whatever, if we just had a meritocracy, you know, if, if the bureaucracy was just made up of people who are really skilled and really smart, then government would work just fine. And I've actually had on some of my videos about bureaucracy, I've had people come up and actually comment that I didn't know what I was talking about. You, know, you can have a skilled bureaucracy look at Imperial China. Uh, and what they are referencing when they say that is the very well-known and famous system known as the Imperial Examination System. This is a system that was established in the Song and Tan dynasties more than a thousand years ago. Prior to that, you had an emperor and then you had an aristocracy that was essentially like feudal. It was, I, I don't know the details, but it was kind of an inherited thing. The gentry, the gentry, the elites, the people who kind of ran the bureaucracy were just, you know, it was a bunch of uh, sycophants and people who had the right family names. Uh, during the Song and Tan dynasties, there was a transition to the imperial examination system, so-called, which was basically the hardest tests that have ever existed. Um, they're still renowned for their extreme difficulty. We're talking about a test uh, where on a country with hundreds of millions of people, only a couple dozen would make it to the top class. Only a few hundred would make it uh, at all. Um, so this is an incredibly competitive uh, examination. And you know, people have commented on my other videos and said, hey, you know, look at this is the way to do it. You have this really hard test. Um, it's objectively uh, graded and you just pick, hey, the best people who get the best scores, they have the most power. The people with the highest scores, you know, it was very hard even to get to the second and third levels. But if you could do that high, you might get an administrative post at a provincial level. If you did the absolute best, you wouldn't be charges. You'd be in charge of huge regions, maybe even the entire country, more or less. Uh, the problem is, the people who advocate that I'm pretty sure have never actually looked at the curriculum of the examination system because the curriculum of the examination system was basically about uh, Confucian philosophy which is not particularly practical when it comes to, you know, running a country, necessarily, and poetry. And getting a high grade ha meant having an extremely stylized um, writing style. I, I forget all the details, and I know I have a subscriber on here who's uh, kind of a professor of Chinese literature, so I'm going to butcher this, and 
he's gonna if he sees this and he knows who he is he can comment below um, but you know there is a whole you had the right an eight-legged pardon the obscure pun um, you know style and and that's and then the other thing is when the Qing took over uh, they wanted to the Qing by the way are not Han Chinese uh, the, the Qing are Manchus from what is now Manchuria, which interesting, CCTV just describes Manchuria as a part of China. When the Manchus were invading, they were not part of China. That's just the CCTV claiming everything is part of China, basically. Um, they took over China, essentially, but they realized they couldn't rule by force forever, so they wanted to placate the Han, the Han literati, the Han Chinese, uh, the people who are in the bureaucracy. And the way that they did that is by being extremely um, deferential to the traditional customs of China to a point. Um, you know, the Kangxi Emperor, for instance, kowtowed before a statue of Confucius nine times and bowed to him three times and, and you know, ordered the scholars to build giant uh, encyclopedias of all the great Tan poetry. And I mean, they basically said, we're going to really respect the culture of, of your society that we've just taken over and we're going to rule. But part of the reason we're good rulers is because we're going to res respect the literary traditions and we're going to patronize, you know, the scholars and the literati of, of your society. And part of that was reinstituting and reemphasizing the, um, the examinations. But part of what they did is they emphasized filial piety and obedience to authority and obedience to hierarchy. And so what's interesting is even though these tests, these examinations are meant to kind of create the best bureaucracy, the problem with that kind of system, and you could say, well, maybe it's stupid that they were emphasizing Confucian poetry, but if they had just picked other things like military acumen or engineering or whatever, which at the very end of the Qing they actually started to do, then that would be fine. But that's not true, because ultimately the tests are going to re reflect whatever the political biases of are of the ruling party, of whatever who's whatever state apparatus is uh, uh, administering the test. Um, now in this case it reflects uh, overt Confucian bias and also a tense uh, a need for national unity. Now it's interesting the Chinese before this with the exception of the Yuan had been ruled by the Han by, by ethnic Chinese, the Chinese people um, and since the Qing were not Chinese they kind of really popularized the idea of a multi-ethnic nation state as opposed to this is a an ethnic eth eth an ethnic group that has a state for it um, and then that that is something that the the current communist Chinese kind of sort of say that they're doing but I think that's false I think the Chinese party is a Han Chinese party and it's an ethnically Chinese party and they're not really multicultural so much as they want to rule over Central Asia. This is happening right now. Like, I don't want to go into it, but like Central Asia is not part of China, as far as I'm concerned, ethnically, historically. Uh, it has been conquered by a foreign state, and they're essentially colonies within Central Asia. But that's a whole other story. I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, but the biases, whatever the biases of the ruling party are, are then going to be reflected in the test, and then that's going to ripple through everyone who's in the bureaucracy. So you're going to have all of these bureaucrats who are really skilled at, you know, debating Mencius or Confucius or writing Tan poetry or emphasizing filial piety, but not so good at anything else. Uh, a good example of this is during the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, they, uh, the imperial, the Qing rulers had to send a general to basically suppress the Taiping and they picked their highest scoring scholar and his name was Zheng Gufan, and Zheng Gufan had no idea how to do anything militarily, so he just said, well, I'm going to be the dad, and all the soldiers are going to be my children. And he developed a system, an entire army. He reorganized the green, the so-called Green Standard Army. I don't want to get into the details, but along Confucian um, filial piety kind of grounds, where you know he's the dad, his subordinates are his sons, and then their subordinates are their sons, and on and on and on. And after 20 million lives in four years, he eventually won the battle, although I don't know how much of it had to do with his skill. He tried to commit suicide twice because he failed so miserably. Um, but then his reforms were not modern at all. They were able to defeat the, the Taiping, who at the end of the day were unarmed, ignorant peasants, by and large. Uh, 
although some of them had apparently a lot of military acumen. Um, and that's the army that China had. And so later, a few decades later, when they started fighting the Japanese, um, they were completely routed. Uh, you know, the, these Confucian reforms were completely worthless. Uh, trying to address, you know, modern problems with Confucian, you know, a devotion to Confucianism uh, was not effective. And China was completely... Um, at the women, you know, they had exposure to Western technology. They had were able to import Western goods. They they saw the power of, of Western stuff, and you know, unlike the Japanese who took one look and then said, "We need to change our ways," they said, "No, we need to be, we have to be traditional." And it's not just like one policy decision. Everyone in the bureaucracy who ran every province, every county in China, they pass those tests and that's what those tests were looking for so it's not something as simple as the rulers made a bad call this is there is their rulers had a meritocracy but their biases were within the meritocracy and so everyone within the bureaucracy not to rhyme too much um, reflected those horrible biases and you know they're not terrible in the sense that you know their biases are let's kill everybody or let's be mean or, or, or malicious it's just that's something that's probably not the best. And the thing is, there isn't something that's the best. You know, the Qing rulers are thinking in terms of how are we going to stay in power? They're not thinking about some Benthamite, what's the best for the most people in China. Now, part of being a good ruler, and this is true for all good rulers, good rulers, is they realize there can't be too much death and destruction and despair in their country. Otherwise, there will be discontent that will eventually fall on their shoulders. Uh, but that's not the same thing as really tr trying to do what's best for everybody. Um, you know, ultimately, the people at the head of, of of these empires, the emperors, were pretty disconnected from reality. Some of them were smart enough to try and know what was going on, but it's hard to keep that system going. So some of the later emperors, I, I don't think, had a clue what was even happening. Um so, you know, the meritocracies are never going to work because whatever the biases of the state apparatus are going to be, they're going to be reflected in the... Uh, there were other things, too, like they uh, uh, they basically had affirmative action. Uh, most of the... Uh, during... during They had a pre... like a pre-industrial revolution in China. Um, there started to be a lot more economic development, a lot more wealth, but it wasn't everywhere in China. It was in the lower Yangtze River. Uh, the most famous city today would be Shanghai, although it included, um, oh God, Nan, Nan, Nanking, Chengdu, Wuchao, the, low, the lower reaches of the Yangtze River, which is where most of the rice was happening. This is where a lot of the foreign commerce was happening. This area was growing very, very rich and powerful to the point where it was essentially heavily subsidizing the North. This had always kind of been the case. The entire Grand Canal is just an attempt to import rice from the south to the north because the north is relatively arid compared to the south. Um, one wonders how much that retarded the growth of the society, but be that as, as it may. Um, you know, so many wealthy people were coming from the lower Yangtze that they were kind of taking over the bureaucracy. All the people smart enough, you know, in order to pass these exams, you had to basically devote all your time to study and most people couldn't afford that. Uh, so you had to be relatively wealthy if you were going to pass. It, 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 I mean, if, if a poor person did well, they could advance. And it did happen, although it was very risky. You're just taking one of your kids and saying, you're not going to have to work. You have to study all the time. And if you do well enough, you'll become a bureaucrat. And then through corruption, you can pay everybody back. That was kind of the, the goal. And actually, the Taiping Rebellion uh, was started by a guy who failed the examination system. He... he past the first level and then he never was able to pass the second level and of course there are all these expectations by his family and his extended family maybe even his entire village they're all kind of counting on him he didn't have to work he just studied all the time and then he couldn't get high enough in the imperial system to you know be able to repay the debt that they had all engaged and he eventually went crazy and then he had a mental breakdown and depression and then he launched a rebellion which set up a competing state that lasted almost 20 years and killed 20 million people. Uh, <laughs> so that's the that's the flip side of having a meritocracy, I suppose. Um, 
But yeah, they got nervous about everybody coming from the Yangtze, so they did actually institute a kind of affirmative action where they get more people from Sichuan or Hubei or some other place. Uh, you know, and they would just kind of tell the tell the people who were grading the test, all right, well, you need to get a couple more people from here or there because you can't have the entire bureaucracy be run by people from the lower Yangtze because then they'll be running the country and not the Manchus or Yuan or the Ming or whoever else was administering the system. Again, the point of the system is not to make what's best for China, it's for the ruler. So if there's any point, you know, the, the reason the Qing, for instance, didn't modernize uh, explicitly was because we wouldn't be able to control, you know, if we start having people think in the modern terms and getting educations outside the country, going to Japan, later in the war they did actually, or later, later in the dynasty they did start having military advisors go to other countries, but, uh, you know, that would be such a loss of control that they weren't willing to do it. Uh, you know, if, if if foreign wisdom and knowledge comes at the expense of obedience to authority, then it won't be taken. Um, you know, just like in the military today, victory and military effectiveness will never be placed if it comes at the sacrifice of obedience to authority. You know, if they could say, hey, we can make soldiers and, and commanders really independent thinking and, you know, um, and have a lot of initiative that they would be able to be more effective on the battlefield, give them a lot of autonomy, basically. They won't do that because if they do that, then they won't be loyal. They won't necessarily be as pawns to the state as much as they would like. And so victory is subordinate and success is subordinate to obedience. Because the success isn't, again, some Benthamite idea of what's best for the state. It's keeping the you know people in power. And that's totally rational self-interest. I almost don't begrudge them for doing that. But I don't think it's wise for the rest of us to imagine that their primary motivation is our benefit, when that's just not the case. It's not the case with anybody, and because they're the state doesn't mean it's the case with them. Um, and this is true now, and this was true in Imperial China, and this is true in Communist China right now as well. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to reading more. Um, there's only a couple dynasties in China, and by the time I finish with them, and I have some of the earlier ones too, but I'm going to read those last. So I'm kind of working from what I'm most familiar with to what I'm least familiar with. So having read these books about the Qing, uh, obviously the Ming are referenced repeatedly, so by the time I get to the Ming, um, you know, I won't be unfamiliar with them. I'm already not unfamiliar with them, but I'll know a lot more when I read the Ming, which will tell me more about the Yuan. And then what's before the Yuan, I think, is the Shang or the Tang, whatever. Uh, at least I can name them now. That's something I couldn't do before I started doing this. So uh, it is interesting. So I, I just, I, now I wait for people to say, oh, well, what about the um, imperial system in China where they had a meritocracy? I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't even know what you're talking about. Um, it did them no good. Uh, all the power of that state. Um, and it was completely left behind by events. Uh, and I think we have these hypothetical debates about like states, <clears throat> any statist today, you know, they would look at China in 1800 and be like, that's the state. That's going to be, they're going to be able to protect their people. They're going to be able to take good care of them. They're going to have the resources at their disposal to act. They have this entire bureaucracy set up based on merit, a meritocracy they have a huge army you know it's centrally controlled and they are going to be able to protect the people and um, the Chinese people are the least protected people basically of the last 200 years with the possible exception of the Russians and what do I mean by that that's the most they're being the ones who have been killed the most by war you know I, I can't begrudge governments too much for natural disasters um, you know the power of mother nature you know, um, anthropomorphized, maybe that's not a good idea, but um, I can't really begrudge a government if a volcano erupts or there's a huge flood. Uh, but their inability to protect from invading armies, and in China we're talking specifically mostly about the Western powers, and especially Japan, counting Japan as a Western power, um, was, was absolutely dismal. They would have had better luck, I think, if they had just been allowed to exist on their own. There probably wouldn't have been wars then. Um, there would have been a lot more commerce with the West instead of uh, wrong-headed battles. Uh, the, 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 the other problem the Qing had, and Chinese rulers, and I think this is something they finally have gotten over, 
is they really fucking thought that they ruled the world, that they were the best people in, in on the planet. Then when these Europeans, plucky Europeans, started coming around saying, well, actually, we're equal and blah, 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 they, uh, the Chinese didn't take for that, and just out of hubris and conceit, you know, they basically picked fights with the British, and, you know, we had ridiculous scenes in the Second Anglo, Sino Anglo, Anglo War, where, you know, thousands of Mongolian cavalry armed with compound bows are attacking you know, British regulars with repeating rifles and canister fire breech loading cannon um, with predictable results. Um, pre predictable to the British at the time and to us in hindsight, but not to the Manchu rulers at the time. Uh, so, anyway, I think that uh, when you, whenever you're getting in a debate and people start quoting history, be very careful not to realize that you know there could be a lot of cherry picking going on. It's not necessarily a malicious intent. They probably read it somewhere someplace, and they're just you know the 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 liberals are going to go and they're going to pick the cherries that paint their worldview, and the conservatives are going to go do the same. And you know what? Libertarians do the exact same thing. And so also be cautious about using that information if you can't double. I mean, at least go back on Wikipedia and start reading synapses of these periods before you start quoting them at length. Um, so, alright, that's pretty much it, and I'll talk to you all later.